Adrian Le Harvel studied art history at Edinburgh University and has spent his career at the National Gallery of Ireland. He initially worked on the groundbreaking summary catalogues when there were few staff and much unfamiliarity with the extent and quality of the collection. He set up the prints and drawings section, bringing material literally out of the basement. He has subsequently worked on exhibitions of works from all areas and published many um, articles and books, including a short monograph on Nathaniel Hone in 1992. Uh, with the title Curator of British Art, Adrian has also been acting Italian and Spanish curator for several years and was responsible for much of the recent rehang of the continental pictures, including the creation of the Grand Gallery. For many years, he has lectured on the relationship between art and music, and we are delighted to have Adrian with us today to present this lecture entitled A Visual History of the Orchestra, Part 2, Beethoven's Legacy. Thanks, Adrian. This is going to be a survey of about two centuries, so um, a little summary in parts. There's a lot of material, and it takes us from the a figure who still has a major influence on us, um, Beethoven, uh, someone I continually return to with um, pleasure and someone um, in whose music uh, there are always new things to discover. When he grew up, the world was very different. Um, a little humour, um, Gilray, the um, British caricaturist here, with a, um, a little uh, group together. These are all identifiable portraits um, and they show um, an interesting moment. We've got um, the early trumpet, horn, even the piano is not yet fully developed. And we have to remember that Beethoven grew up in a time of personal patronage. Um, Vienna was a great musical city, but it actually had no concert halls at all. And he's very far, perhaps, from the romanticized figure um, or the, the more introverted um, character he later became. These are two early portraits, and you can imagine him uh, frequenting um, the, the salons of his, his patrons, pleasing them, and finally moving into the um, realm of the orchestra, very much reflecting developments um, in the horn. Uh, Giovanni Punto virtuoso made a brief Viennese visit, but had a major impact on the development of that side of the orchestra. And you can see here in the early 18th century, um, and contemporary instruments, uh, the amazing changes that have gone there. And it's something to bear in mind all the time that through the 19th century, um, all the parts of the orchestra are undergoing development. Domenico Dragonetti, um, virtuoso on the double bass, um, here drawn when he was at the Edinburgh Festival in 1815, was a Another figure who had a great influence on the development of the, the string section, particularly, of course, the, the double bass. This is where Beethoven um, made a number of appearances, um, uh, typical theatre setting, and there's, there's a wonderful record um, from the composer Louis Spohr in um, 1808, um, when he was supposed to be playing his piano concerto, um, but in fact, he got up and um, started um, conducting, waving his arms rather wildly. He even managed to, to break six strings of the piano. So this is a, a man who was full of incredible energy. I have to admit to a slight cheat here, um, the, the Michael Katsuroff um, drawing on the right hand, sorry, lithograph on the right hand side in his drawing, by a man who was um, obsessed with Beethoven in the 20th century. And since we just don't have images of him uh, conducting or on the podium, uh, this is uh, just to give you a sense um, of the man. On the left-hand side, um, Beethoven's favorite portrait by Josef Mähler, which he actually kept uh, in his room, um, as a more seer-like figure um, with, uh, you can see, an antique-style lyre um, in landscape. Again, um, in his um, development period, early years, very much a sort of a, um, a part of his era, a part of the whole world. Deafness, his own 
musical explorations, um, it's said that you can actually parallel his life story in his symphonies. Um, all this creates the, the great works that we um, now so much admire. And this is where an officer, one often has to be careful in interpretation. Um, uh, another uh, famous portrait, Josef Stieler, where he's actually at, ma at work on the credo of the Mrs. Solemnis. Um, and you can see how in the, the first engraving made of it by Friedrich Turk, um, just the, the mouth, the eyes gain a different intensity. They give you a very different impression. Beethoven personally, not perhaps the nicest person. Um, uh, he's trying to create um, the new role of the independent musician. Um, and he has to often play off sides. Uh, he did offer the Mrs. Solemnis to five different publishers at the same time. He even claimed there were two more in the pipeline, um, uh, none of which ever um, uh, uh, emerged. Um, so he, he could be a bit unscrupulous and um, he was um, difficult to deal with. Uh, he's one of the most visited people in Vienna um, in the last 20 years of his life. So we've got a lot of accounts of him, um, which make fascinating reading. So you can set against the, um, the work that he's doing. And um, as um, one of the major um, conductors of a uh, period orchestra, uh, as Roger Norrington has pointed out, um, even deaf, there's hardly a technical fault um, in his orchestration. You look at the original scores. Uh, probably the more effective image, um, uh, unexpected source, Eric von Stroheim, the actor who played him um, in a cameo role in Napoleon. Um, uh, you can relate that to that Stieler portrait and you can see how artists do tend to exaggerate um, features and um, perhaps um, unduly influences in our posthumous reputation. Um, better known face of uh, von Stroheim in Sunset Boulevard. Another um, unknown artist, um, more or less contemporary, and this is uh, the last concert where um, Beethoven um, was actually present. Um, uh, again, in a previous account, um, we said that uh, he waved his arm so wildly that he sort of sensed the, the candles um, flying um, off the, the podium. And here, although he wasn't actually the conductor, um, it was the uh, musician Urlauf, one of his close circle, who was actually um, uh, waving the baton, um, he stood apparently um, behind him and um, threw himself back and forth like a madman. At one moment, he stretched his full height. The next, he crouched to the ground. He flayed about with his hands and feet um, as though he wanted to play all the parts himself. Um, uh, quite a spectacle. He didn't even know when the music had finished. And this was an incredible concert. You've got the Mrs. Solemnis, you've got the Ninth Symphony, and you've got a few other things thrown in as well. Um, uh, a number of people left, apparently. It wasn't a good time. Um, uh, most of the major Viennese families and the royal family were away for the summer. Um, and he also um, took on the cost of the concert himself as impresario um, and um, apparently collapsed when the miserable receipts were brought to him. Uh, here you actually see him drawn a few days afterwards uh, by Stefan Decker. Um, turned into a lithograph, which um, pleased Beethoven, apparently. He gave it away to friends, possibly because he had free copies. Um, but it certainly, again, gives you the gravitas of this major figure. And again and again, um, all the composers through, um, even into our own day, keep referring back to him and what he did. Um, and I say, if you start to examine the scores, his orchestration particularly, um, one sees so many developments um, taking place. That, of course, was right at the, the, uh, the forefront of what was happening in music. Uh, back in London at the Theatre Royal Drury Lane, um, you can see the Regency audience um, much more interested in chats than it is listening. Um, you do see the orchestra rather uh, nicely and clearly there. Um, it almost looks like a, a modern call centre with these sort of um, banks of um, screens in front of them. There's no sign of any conductor um, keeping them all together. And uh, this was still the era when musicians tended to work within their own um, little um, grouping. 
And um, again, um, in New York, 1822, um, some sense of the, the bustle, the compression, the little space that's actually given over to the musicians um, compared with the, the width of the, the stage above. Um, still a time when music was um, frequently included um, in dramatic works. Here you get um, really the, you might say the, uh, the architecture of the pit. Um, just two examples I, I've chosen. Uh, you can see the, the Viennese Theater Kerner Tour, 1821 at the top um, with a nicely laid out or, um, uh, pit, uh, a very clear podium for the conductor at the center who's also engaging with what's happening um, on the stage. And then down below, not so clearly read, but um, the, the Covent Garden um, pit, um, which uh, here is expanded into um, uh, more of the sort of the, the regular grouping that we expect to, to see. I've talked of conductors and um, this was still a sore point. Um, uh, Wilhelm Kramer, um, who acted in, in London from the late 1790s, uh, had one wonderful quote where um, uh, there was someone who, who was about to conduct the orchestra and he says, uh, oh, when the, the gentleman sits down, I will begin. Um, so as a leader, he felt he was the one who should be leading the um, orchestra, literally. Um, and for a couple of centuries, um, one occasionally sees images appearing um, of gentlemen waving pieces of paper. This is Francis Avis Richter, um, who was very much, you might say, of the older generation. He was in sort of semi-retirement, really, in, in Strasbourg Cathedral, writing um, rather fine music at the end of the 18th century. And here he is in the, the choir loft um, uh, conducting them. But there's also, as you can see, the uh, violinist there and uh, could well have had a, an orchestra um, with him on occasion. The figure who really um, creates the modern conductor is Karl Maria Weber. Um, sadly, he died young, literally, um, uh, at the moment of the premiere of Oberon at Covent Garden, which, as the poster proudly announced, you can see there, um, uh, he was conducting um, and uh, in this triple view um, after drawing by James Hayter, you actually see him um, conducting the Freischutz, which he put on um, a few days earlier at Covent Garden. Note the dress. Now it's evening dress, very smart. He's actually got some sort of recognisable baton. Hasn't quite developed as we, we see it now, but he's clearly a um, figure at the centre um, who is really directing um, affairs in the orchestra. And these start to become quite complex. Um, the Société des Concerts in Paris, um, formed of members of the Conservatoire, um, put on concerts um, from the 1820s. And uh, here you can see the, the, the layout. Um, a little hard to read, but it, we've also got a choir here. It's got, um, got the singers down at the, um, the, the bottom. Then you've got the violins um, flanking piano and harp, and then gradually banks with the, the woodwind um, moving up to the, the cellos in opposition with the trumpets and finally the percussion um, at the back. And uh, here you can see how long this um, sort of arrangement seems to have um, survived. Uh, it's obviously a, a late 19th century photograph of the, the Conservatoire. And here you see a engraving from 1843 um, of um, probably a student concert taking place. Uh, again, quite a small space when you actually um, see the, the room itself and literally the, the figures in banks um, up the back. So quite a practical solution and one that you will see um, is used quite a lot during the 19th century. Of course, the, the theater is a, a major place still for um, performances um, where Again, at Covent Garden here, in a sort of lovely watercolour, um, showing part of Shakespeare's Henry VIII. Um, uh, some sense of the orchestra, um, less perhaps than we've seen so far. It's always these with double basses, of course, that stand out because of the size um, of their um, instruments. Um, uh, some sense of the, the strings there at the centre and the general throng. Um, here we are, uh, again, a reminder of the, uh, the immensity um, of the of the 
Opera House, not the one we see now because um, uh, it burnt down in um, 1856. Ferdinand Gasser is an interesting character because he produced um, a book um, with no less than 21 different layouts for orchestras in Germany and Austria. So I'm just showing you literally two, um, really for um, particular um, contrast. Uh, at the top, you can see the orchestra in Darmstadt. Um, we're actually looking from the stage, it's a bit back to back. So at the, at the back of there, you've got the, um, the director, the, the conductor uh, flanking him, uh, violins, his, his basses, and then um, a, a central line of violins and viola, rather unusually, um, with flanking uh, the woodwind um, and um, finally the, the percussion. Um, if you're performing out of doors, as at the bottom there, the, the Terrace Concert Orchestra in Dresden, of course, sound matters. And so the center is dominated by the brass and the, uh, the, the strings get sort of pushed to the side. So they're not all the, the same layout. It is a reminder of the um, need to um, vary it to fit the circumstances. I mentioned Roger Norrington um, and uh, his um, uh, Orchestre Révolution et Romantique um, has done really pioneering work in um, not just reviving, but actually reinfusing the energy um, of um, music of the era. They started off by doing the whole cycle of Beethoven symphonies. Um, they've been through um, Schumann, uh, getting up to, to, to Wagner and even planning um, to go on um, into the, the 20th century. Um, by using period and replica instruments, uh, one of the key things that he quickly discovered was that you could actually play fortissimo, even in Beethoven, without overwhelming the audience. So the only problem with the modern orchestra, the instruments are so powerful that they can um, actually distort music. This is a recreation of one particular occasion, uh, another great figure of the 19th century, Hector Berlioz. Um, his Symphonie Fantastique um, was put on um, at its premiere with a, a grand backdrop uh, painted by Pierre Cicieri. Um, we don't obviously have the backdrop anymore. The sketch um, you can see top left, um, and it was um, literally repainted um, when uh, there was a recreation at Versailles in 2018, um, for what must have been quite an occasion. And you can see the um, size of the, the um, orchestra now and um, the variety, um, uh, the original scoring, um, doubled flutes, oboes, clarinets, but four horns, cornets, uh, two trumpets, three trombones, um, three ophicleides, harps and strings, um, and three types of drum. So um, uh, Berlioz, um, of course, was a, a great enthusiast. He saw the Berlin Opera Orchestra in the 1840s, where they um, had around 40 players, and in his famous treatise on instrumentation in 1844, um, he uh, actually um, proposed uh, 117, but um, 460 would be good for certain performances. So he, he thought, as you might say, big, um, uh, and, sorry, oh, yeah. pardon me, ah, oh, we don't, um, Are you getting everything on screen okay? We're not, shall I get rid of that? Um, yes. Yeah, fine, sorry, There's me and technology again. Um, noise though was the thing that everyone associated uh, uh, with him. And uh, here's a typical caricature as well. Happily, the, the room is sound, it resists. as uh, no less than a cannon is being um, fired as well. This, um, on the left-hand side, you can see the, the serpent, we now know, but the, the Ophiclidae is now an obsolete instrument. The, these are um, early examples at Snow's Hill. Um, when that print we're just looking at was reissued, uh, it got included, but again, put on a giant scale, you can see there on the right-hand side, and the, the reaction of the audience is obvious. 
Um, as with so much um, new and unexpected music, um, think the Rite of Spring in the 20th century, for instance, um, uh, people just weren't accustomed to what they were hearing. It took time for these things to um, become um, the mainstream. Uh, again, 1845, um, Berlioz was at the Cercle Olympique um, conducting a Moroccan march. And you can see these Arab figures here recoiling in horror at the, the noise. Um, Honoré Dormier, um, a wonderful caricaturist uh, and a particular interest in music. And uh, he here, as you can see, is again parodying this uh, with the um, figure playing the basin here with the mallet and uh, a cannon about to be fired by the conductor. More gentilly, back in Vienna, um, we see a Johann Strauss gallop. So this is a very fashionable dance um, of this era. Everyone's sort of, um, going around in a circle. We've got the orchestra there at the top. Um, obviously some license has been taken, but you can um, see the, the various constituents um, of it at least. And of course, a big um, drum, plenty of ancillary brass there hanging on the wall. This is a, a charming little illustration. Um, Charles Dickens's London Sketches um, by Boz, 1836, was illustrated with woodcuts. Um, and uh, he went to the famous Vauxhall Gardens, which have existed since the 18th century, um, but were now really on their last legs. Um, and he describes uh, sort of a motley um, crew, uh, a small group of dismal men in cocked hats executing the overture to Tancredi. Um, and uh, there's always a singer there as well, um, as you can see. Richard Wagner, um, next we might say key figure of the, of the 19th century. Um, always respectful and looking back to Beethoven, but of course going into much different ground. Um, initially, um, still very much um, following traditions um, for his opera Rienzi um, at the, uh, the Semper Opera in Dresden in 1842. Um, he had a, a fairly traditional um, orchestra. Um, and uh, although the uh, artist here is, is giving us a sort of a rather brief account of it, um, you can see uh, the, the main elements and strings, a double bass, you've got a, a harp there on the right hand side. And here um, you can see the, the whole um, image. And much music in the theater, of course, was still, um, uh, might say, incidental um, here to A Midsummer Night's Dream, um, uh, unknown um, location. And uh, conductor probably getting the, the, the biggest role. We've got a sort of harpist there and you can see um, something that continually features and it seems to have been something that actually happened, how close often the um, audience got and they're almost sort of intermingling um, with the orchestra itself. Of course, if you were just playing bit music for a play, a drama, uh, it could get a bit boring. So uh, Henri Daumier here um, having a bit of fun um, even the conductor is falling asleep while the actors in their sort of Greek costumes are performing above them. I'm going to very briefly just go through a few images from London in, and sorry, from Britain in the 1840s. Um, if only to emphasize the sort of trends that happen. Uh, the, the Hanover Square concert hall rooms uh, opened back in the 1770s. They've gone through changes of, of management. Um, they carried on into the 19th century and um, started using this sort of the bank system. Um, it's actually quite practical because it gives you a much better view um, of the musicians when, um, as here, you were seated in on these rather regimented hard benches and down in the, in the concert hall. The Royal Philharmonic Orchestra, still going strong in Liverpool. This is a, a year after their foundation um, and in the um, rather splendid surroundings of the Philharmonic Hall, um, which um, at the time was a, a rather exclusive uh, venue um, described as for the, um, the rich citizens of, of the, the, the city um, and uh, had 2100 capacity 
Um, they at times would actually have an orchestra of 250. So we can explain something of the throng here. There's probably an oratorio being performed. You can see quite a few singers at the front. Um, and the, the mandatory organ that becomes part um, of the, the concert hall at the back. St. Martin's Hall, Long Acre, London, um, no longer with us. Um, the opening concert um, and, and very much the features we've, we've just been looking at. And, uh, again, the, uh, the crowd themselves are uh, rather more interested in chatter it would seem than listening um, to the music, but they, they started to enjoy these really big forces in the, the early Victorian era. And it brings us to Louis Antoine Julien, um, who is really the, um, the first star conductor. Um, uh, Paul Weber, um, dying young, really never perhaps fulfilled his potential. Um, uh, Schumann in Leipzig uh, was always being attacked because he was no good at really keeping his orchestra together. But um, Julien um, knew just how to look. Uh, you see the evening suit. He had white kid gloves brought to him on a silver tray. Um, he had his favorite baton. There's a, a lovely set you can see at the top here. Um, he had a walking stick that came apart and revealed his conducting stick, shooting fork, and even some sunglasses. Um, and apparently at times he would pick up a violin and play during a performance. Um, at, uh, at the end, he might sink exhausted into his seat. So he's uh, someone who was very much yeah, a showman. Um, conducting here at Drury Lane, um, very much placing himself right at the, the center um, of the orchestra there. Again, on this, this tiered bank, uh, this concerto is being played. You see the, the piano there at the bottom. And with the Covent Garden Orchestra here, taking on no less than four military bands. Um, uh, there were obviously had bandmasters, you know, they like to have their role as well, um, but he was at the, the center of the events. And uh, there's this incredible drum you can see hanging there uh, across the, the room. And uh, one just wonders what sound, it must have been like a thunderclap when it was actually played, the, the more traditional timpani alongside. This I think is a, a rather nice view of, of Covent Garden um, where we see a state visit. Napoleon III was visiting London, uh, Queen Victoria and Prince Albert took him to Covent Garden and they took it to the Royal Box. But um, the view that we have is looking up in the orchestra. So we now start to see more of the, the banked players, more of the, the individual instruments um, and um, the, the growing size of the pit that's um, now necessary. If you were a regular concert goer, you would almost certainly have gone to St. James's Hall on Piccadilly. There is now the Meridienne Hotel on the site. Um, and this is where a lot of the big London concerts took place. It had a two and a half thousand capacity. So it was a, it was a big hall, it doesn't seem it, in this um, little wood engraving. Um, and uh, it started to establish the more familiar um, flat stage again. You can see the conductor there in the distance um, and of course had to have an organ. Not all music making is indoors. Um, and one should remember the more popular orchestras such as we still have today, uh, the Cremorn Gardens just off the King's Road in London uh, were a favorite venue to go to, to um, listen to music, to dance um, at the same time. And um, lest you think this was a sort of a, a, a modest um, uh, undertaking, uh, they had no less than 50 musicians uh, performing, not all obviously shown here in this particular painting by Fevis Levine. Cremorne Gardens became famous a little later because that's where Whistler painted a number of his nocturnes, including firework display. When the Crystal Palace for the Great Exhibition was taken down, it was moved to Sydenham in South London and 
it was put up again and it was turned into exhibition and concert space. And they would have regular Saturday concerts. There were even free rehearsals midweek. Um, they thought big. Um, here you could see the opening ceremony and this similar design um, of the big sort of shell um, for an orchestra um, where um, we've got this incredible number of musicians um, uh, assembled. And it's, it's not fantasy. This is uh, um, very much um, as happened. Um, the platform was raked at 42 degrees. It could hold 1,700 performers. Um, and for this opening, Covent Garden Orchestra was there, 21 provincial choirs, three military bands, all under Michael Costa, and an audience of 30,000. So um, they got big. And of course, um, one of the highlights was the annual Handel Festival. And here you see from 1857, um, one of the, the first big occasions um, with no less than 500 in the orchestra, um, three and a half thousand in the choir and soloists, um, uh, organ at the back and in the crowd, some 23,000. Um, it was unfortunately as Queen Victoria recorded, um, she being there, uh, the heat was awful. It was like being in a hot house. And so it wasn't perhaps the most enjoyable experience. It's all glass, of course. So it does bring in the, or hold in the heat um, but these sort of great monster occasions carried on. Uh, George Bernard Shaw, um, music critic, 1890-94, described it um, when the Messiahs were formed as a dull, lumbering, heavy-footed choral monster in these hands. Uh, he preferred it smaller forces. Uh, he even wanted to pass a law that you wouldn't be allowed to have more than 42 musicians um, actually backing it. The... Handel events carried on um, into the um, 1920s until um, the Crystal Palace burnt down in 1926. Here you get a, a detail of the 1865 one. Um, Illustrated London News is a great source for sort of rapportage before um, photography um, was used in newspapers. Um, and uh, obviously, it, 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 you know, it, it, it not giving you the full impression, it gives you some sense of what um, these occasions were like. And often one can pick out interesting details, even the, in the, the drum that's uh, there at the, at the back, it's got a lot of percussion. I've briefly mentioned developments in instruments. Um, a key one was the flute, uh, Carl Burm, uh, whose instruments are still with us. Um, produced various patents. Um, 1847 flute was one of the most advanced. You see him here um, photographed on the right hand side by Franz Hamstegel, Munich photographer, um, whom Wagner used in order to create a, a very grand iconography of himself for public consumption. And the difference, very obvious when you um, look to something from the same decade, the more traditional flute, the, the lack of keys of range. Uh, very soon, Berm developed the silver flute um, once he got springs organized, um, as again is still um, in use today. So uh, very uh, a key development um, and uh, bringing a new sophistication um, to the instrument. Jean-Baptiste, Viom, great maker of string instruments, also a collector of historic ones. I'm always amazed that one can still play Stradivarius, Gaspar de Solo, these um, 16th, early 17th century instruments. Um, unlike other early instruments, which um, uh, just either decay or um, become totally obsolete. The piano, um, even in Beethoven's lifetime, he went from Stern, the leading Viennese maker, with a very light tone, as one hears it, to um, the Broadwood that he was sent um, as a, a gift in order to, to promote the instrument as well. It was understood that uh, uh, key players would um, show off the instrument, it would reflect on the, the maker's firm. Um, Julius Blutner ruled for a time um, until the 1860s when Steinway comes along. And now, as we know, um, no concert platform is complete without the black gleaming um, 23 layers of lacquer 
um, on the on the the best coats of the model. They, they come in um, seventeen different um, models. Um, However, one should not deride Glutner. Um, one of the great experiences of 2019 was Andras Schiff playing um, this Blutner, which he brought over to Dublin. And um, when he played Brahms um, with the Orchestra of the Enlightenment, again, using original and um, replica instruments, the, the whole tone was amazing and um, unified. And um, the piano was in perfect synchrosy. Um, Steinway is great, but it's, it's, it's a heavy piano and it does create a, a, a very different sort of um, sound impression. Adolf Sachs was the great brass king. He liked to call himself a maker inventor of brass instruments. Um, and lest you forget his name, you can see here the saxophone, the sax horn, sax tuba, the sax trabone. Um, he uh, used his own name quite freely. Uh, Again, with Bernard Shaw, um, uh, he uh, derided this development. It gave perhaps uh, too much strength to that part of the orchestra. Um, uh, and uh, the main market at the time probably were, were marching bands. Um, not that uh, everything took off um, quickly. Uh, the saxophone, for instance, was painted in 18, 18, 1846. 14 different models, but the first time you actually see it seriously used um, is 1872 in Georges Bouget's La Lesienne. Um, so uh, the composers might take a little time to react. And some instruments have not taken the test of time. The uh, Pierre-Louis Gaudreau's Sarousophone here, you can see, um, uh, I don't think anybody would be playing that today. Hans von Bülow, um, a key conductor um, of the, the period, uh, uh, somewhat satirized um, uh, by Hans Schliesmann. Um, you can see the rather more elegant appearance here on the left-hand side. Um, a man who did much to promote Wagner by conducting various premieres. Uh, he also got to put up with um, Wagner running off with his wife Cosima. Um, but despite that, um, they uh, remained on good terms. And he is the one who conducts the first cycle of The Ring at Bayreuth. The Festival Theatre, um, complete change in theatre thinking. Um, now the orchestra was going to be hidden. Um, this is a, a, a rather strange initially when you see it. Um, the, uh, print showing the orchestra, there's the conductor literally at the top um, and the, the banks of players um, down to the, the brass at the bottom. It makes more sense when you see the pit itself um, literally concealed so that the sound emanated. And in fact, you came into a darkened theatre. Um, you, you sat there, you didn't chat during the overture. Um, and of course, the music would come mysteriously towards you. There was nothing happening on stage while the overtures were played. So all the concentration was on the music. It's all part of Wagner's great scheme. And then of course, you could be sitting through three or four hours. So um, as Mark Twain reported when he was there in 1885, the whole evening um, ended up almost six hours long because they took um, two intervals, an hour and, and one or three quarters in that, to give people time for a whole dinner as well as additional refreshments. Wagner, of course, is caricatured um, wonderfully here by Spy on the left-hand side, he's sort of seated conducting, and then in the oversized head by um, Click. And you can guess that it's, it's the big noise that people really object to. And um, uh, there's also, of course, this new development um, for all the enthusiasm for Wagner with many, um, the French became gradually sort of uh, distance from him. Didn't help, of course, the, the Franco-German War of 1870, 71. And this is what's being referred to here, the new siege of Paris as uh, Wagner um, cowering there in the background um, as um, the um, tuba cannons um, unleash their forces. In Paris itself, um, uh, here we have uh, two pictures coming up um, by Edgar Degas, the great Impressionist, um, a man um, obviously uh, concerned to depict everyday life in his paintings, um, and here focusing um, particularly on his um, friend, 
sorry, uh, Desilo, um, the bassoonist, um, uh, who is uh, playing here um, at the opera, he actually introduced him um, to going there and um, seated right bang up to the um, orchestra. You can see um, Degas again uh, with Maya Beer's Robert de Le Diable. This was the first of the really big production operas of the 19th century in 1836, um, and it continued in the, the repertoire. One has to say that uh, Degas is perhaps more interested in the people um, and the sense of movement and light um, than uh, giving us a photographic record of the orchestra. We're, we're seeing quite a few figures, uh, uh, though the man on the left-hand side there is uh, clearly more interested in looking at what's happening up in the, the boxes. And of course, the opera was the great place um, to visit. Uh, his friend Desiree Dillot, uh, the bassoonist, is, is shown just by his instrument there in the center. Not obviously the best place actually to listen because the sound is a bit too um, intense and uh, um, a little light humor. Um, the great um, big singer, literally, uh, Marietta Elboni um, in Rossini opera at the Teatro Italien, where again, you get the sense of the, the heads of the orchestra and the parts of their um, instruments, uh, the applause and the bouquet thrown on stage. In America, um, the, the first university orchestra is still going strong and um, touring worldwide, the Pirellian Sodality at, at Harvard University, um, uh, they got into trouble a lot for their sort of riotous carryings on when they weren't actually playing. They were sort of um, twice banned by the university. But here you see them back in 1871. Um, as photography now makes its entrance and we start to have um, more interesting records um, of um, musicians, um, not that the um, painting and print had gone away. Um, and uh, as a riposte to all the boys, um, Frau Anna Weilich uh, had an all woman orchestra. You can see them. Uh, here on stage, uh, looking highly respectable, but uh, um, a time when uh, the violin wasn't necessarily thought suitable uh, for female players, a sort of change that finally um, happens in the late 19th century, and certainly um, not all those big cellos and double basses at the back there. It tended to be the virtuoso show off who got attention, and so um, Charles Lemere. Um, well known in Paris for his antics. Um, it's very likely um, that uh, in the prints there on the left hand side, um, he's actually conducting Emmanuel Chabré's Espana um, of 1883, which was dedicated um, to him and which does call, call for very large forces uh, four bassoons, two trumpets, two cornets, three trombones and full percussion, so it probably would have made quite a noise, as you can see being suggested, a um, more respectful image of him on the right-hand side. George Bernard Shaw um, took the pseudonym Basso de Cornetto, um, referring back to the Renaissance instrument, the, the cornet. Um, uh, here you see a 19th century evolution of it. Uh, again, it's um, not one that survived. Um, really because of its raucous noise, he liked to cause an upset. Um, he's not really a great musician. He's a wonderful observer and critique, um, and he's, he's always making um, comments on how people should improve things. But he's a, a great read, and the um, three volumes, as they were later um, produced as a book of his music criticisms, are um, very um, full of interesting sort of uh, insights into how music was actually being performed. What he particularly um, reacted against was the lack of rehearsal time. Um, the Manchester band, as he equipped it, was the only one in Britain that um, actually did take time to rehearse. Wagner seems to have found a particular niche in Britain, um, and even um, on a, a ship we see here um, a royal member, Alfred Duke of Edinburgh, taking part um, um, in this amateur orchestra society, uh, doing the overture to Wagner's Tannhäuser. Um, not sure whether the parrot played a part and the hanging pineapples might have made an interesting uh, um, 
bit of sort of reverberation of sound, but uh, it certainly shows the amateur enthusiasm. Of course, Bar uh, Shaw himself wanted to start a Wagner festival at Richmond, um, particularly faced with 40 hours travel to get to Bayreuth, and then there was never any accommodation um, and awful food. You don't perhaps associate Verdi with Paris, but um, he had his tribulations at La Scala, where again he found difficulties in the orchestra, the, the power struggles between the different parts, particularly the, with the leader. Um, the Paris um, orchestra, the opera, initially um, uh, he found troublesome, but in fact by the time he returned to conduct Aida, in 1880, as we see him here, it was acknowledged to be one of the, the best in Europe. And um, for instance, uh, he had 167 rehearsals um, for the Sicilian Vespers um, in 1855. Lighter music, Johann Strauss with the court ball. Um, uh, interesting because it actually shows us again a view from the um, orchestra looking across. You see um, a, a little more of the, the instruments and players. It's probably uh, simplified down um, a little from the, the full forces that he had. Sometimes it's a bit frustrating. Um, John Singer Sargent is more interested in the impression of the moment. Um, the Pas de Loupe Orchestra, which was um, performed frequently at the Cercle d'Hiver. This was a more popular venue in Paris. And um, it also had circuses um, as uh, still continue. And both Toulouse-Lautrec and Edgar Degas um, both painted there. Um, but you do get the sense of this sort of sense surround as it must have been with the, the, the circular um, stadium. Noise though is the thing that most caricature is highlighted uh, with Mahler, um, his symphony number no. one, in 1890, uh, or his modern music, where we also get uh, Richard Strauss in this rather odd lead bar on the left-hand side, and Schoenberg playing the sewing machine. Um, Mahler, I think for the length, the complexity of his music, again, not really finding a willing audience. And although this is a much later painting by Max Oppenheimer, it gives you a sense of the, the, the energy and force um, of a a Mahler performance um, uh, with the Vienna Philharmonic. Of course, um, some of his demands uh, couldn't always be met. Uh, the thousand performers he wanted for his Symphony No. 8 uh, achieved at the premiere here in 1910. There is Mahler actually in the center of the orchestra. Uh, Leopold Stokowski had to make do with 100 um, for his performance uh, in the first American um, uh, premiere uh, in 1928. Uh, Stokowski, um, very much of the, the 20th century, again, another great personality, someone who really knew his scores, who would uh, be um, quite energized and uh, even irascible um, um, on stage and demanded that um, he be the, the central focus. Leonard Bernstein, um, great admirer, um, and there was a fascinating interview when he um, conducted at the proms in 1969, sorry, 1987. Um, he was 69, the first time he'd been invited. Um, and uh, he proposed that, uh, that the symphony had really died with Mahler. When the BBC interviewer um, gently pointed out that he'd written three himself, well, yes, he said, but uh, that was before I knew the jig was up. It's a typical throwaway remark by him, but uh, a reminder that the the, the, the symphony um, has survived and become such a mainstay of the 20th um, century. We've been very Eurocentric, and so um, this is a, a very brief um, cross-reference to Japan um, where things don't have to evolve. Uh, if you went to the Kabuki Theatre in the 17th century, you would still see the same orchestra um, as today, um, where even the reciters, the, the people sort of, um, saying and uh, mouthing words actually are part of the orchestration. The, um, you see the, the lute, three types of drum and the, the bamboo flute. Here is the only surviving historic Kabuki theater. And again, it looks exactly as they did in 1603 when the, the whole tradition started. The orchestra actually was on stage generally behind the actors with additional noises like gongs and percussion provided from behind the screens to the side. 
In London, uh, the Queen's Hall was another menu, to, uh, a great venue till it was bombed in um, 1943 at the opening concert. Uh, the royals were there, so hence uh, more like a, um, entertaining to see the, the tables at the front. Um, it had, of course, the mandatory um, organ um, and um, a reminder, of course, of the uh, most played uh, organ piece in the Hansel Hall is probably the Saint-Saëns um, organ symphony. Styles, um, Henry Wood becomes most associated with the Queen's Hall, um, but his energized performance will contrast with Richard Strauss, um, who um, always said that you should conduct uh, more from the head than the, the hands. You can um, see him here late in life. And Henry Wood here commemorated um, uh, some sepulchres in London where they have this just chap museum's chapel. It's a rather nice piece of um, stained glass. Acknowledgement of a different tradition, uh, Samuel Coleridge Taylor, uh, the first probably important black um, composer conductor in Britain, um, coming out of Croydon um, and emerging as a major um, symbol at the time, particularly in the States. This is a rather nice little drawing of him um, conducting. Serge Kuzovitsky, um, bringing sort of notable name the 20th century. Again, it's more like sort of ranks of soldiers there, his orchestra, but uh, Robert Stirl responded to the energy and uh, rather nice Alexander Skriabin, the, who was in um, Berlin at the time, was also captured. Not always that informative, uh, Dufy and um, Shin here, again showing its oblique views of the orchestra pits. A better view from Spencer Gore here in London painting where we look down into the, the pit and you can analyze quite a lot of the, the detail here, the old Alhambra theater, you can see the exotic Arab decor in the background. And Wagner, always popular, at the end of Gotthedemmerung, all the forces coming together um, in this illustration. Nearing the end, just, um, of course, the big change in the 20th century is recording. It took time to develop. Um, the first 1900, um, Robert Mapleson made early wax recordings, literally from the, the side of the stage at the Met, which are very crude. Um, 1905, the first real orchestral recordings. Um, and here we see in 1910 um, in Berlin, uh, Arnold uh, Schweitweiler, um, and just how difficult it was. But note that they do turn out um, in evening dress. One of the major developers of recording Victor Records, um, the first to start electric recording in 1925, which was revolutionized things. They produced the um, longer disc that would still take 10 discs to um, record Pagliacci, um, it's not a long opera, um, in the 1922 version. Um, uh, but before microphones, when you could actually lay out your orchestra in a more um, logical fashion, everyone literally had to crowd around the um, recording. And a lot of halls still being converted way up to the, the 1940s and 50s, so the famous Kingsway Hall in Hoburn, um, because it was a Methodist hall, it had an organ, which was quite convenient, but also um, wood floors, vaulted basement, um, nice ceiling. It was actually very good acoustic. Uh, the only problem was the underground, uh, which caused rumblings on occasion. You still get actually at the back of some of the recordings. Raoul Dufy, we saw um, in the, the pit in Le Havre, um, he was a great concert girl. Um, he does these fascinating pictograms. So you can actually read quite a lot of um, detail and analyze them and different dispositions um, of the orchestra. And the Vienna Philharmonic Orchestra here in 1862, not an instrument in sight, but the big group photograph. And of course, big um, uh, reminder of where we are, um, this is the Philharmonic in 1926. Uh, they uh, have uh, made a speciality of instruments. In fact, even their timpani uh, is a design that was made about 1900. So they've been very conscious of the uh, composition of the um, orchestra. Uh, Ferdinand Schmitzer was a photographer um, here taking this slightly oblique view. And this we had at the start, um, the first of their concerts since March, 
um, at the Music for Rhine, uh, 45 musicians only, um, 100 guests, um, not economic, not using the full potential of the orchestra. Um, and uh, uh, until very recent events, you know, part of this bleak outlook, um, surges of people opening up and then closing down again, um, all the, the difficulties we're all too aware of. And the scientific looking at how humans disseminate, disseminate um, viruses, um, spacing, I mean, three meters, um, five meters at the Berlin Philharmonic, um, which seems really quite um, excessive. And um, as been pointed out, um, destroys the, the contact and the um, ability to play together often of musicians. During this whole period, of course, it's been the um, lack of ability to perform live, the interaction with the audience, the experience and what it um, brings to a performance that has been um, quite highlighted. Um, and um, it was heartening. Uh, this was the, the first concert gala. Uh, they, they brought in three conductors and they put the orchestra actually on the stage um, at the center of the Roman amphitheater in Verona. But just look at the contrast, 3,000, which is pretty staggering, um, compared to 13,500, the, the norm. Um, and of course, only 70 uh, musicians. The proms had two weeks of live music after three months. But again, a bit of a disappointment um, uh, promoted uh, in the vast cavernous spaces of the Albert Hall to hear Simon Rattle, um, not a member of an audience um, in sight. And of course, our new vocabulary um, as we get used to the streaming, but um, uh, as has been um, pointed out, um, uh, not always um, satisfactory. The, the limp and listless um, uh, proms, as they were described by one um, music critic, and uh, uh, even uh, how digital is entertaining, but it gets boring. Um, uh, Sebastian Norman, director of the um, Concert House in Berlin, um, However, these are things we, we live with for the moment, and there's hope because uh, the Australia seems to be coming through things more quickly and uh, going up 75, even 100% capacity audiences. And so things are good for the future. And um, certainly the orchestra will continue to evolve, although um, even before all this, of course, there were threats because of the numbers and the costs um, of actually running them. Uh, not necessarily the main part of their performing portfolio uh, for musicians, as uh, one a press release described it. Oh, well, we should uh, lend on a lighter note, um, and uh, Robert Layton here um, with a, a little cartoon uh, showing that uh, however much they're part of a group, uh, orchestras are made up of individuals and they have their own personalities and uh, certainly um, they do tend to be very feisty, and so I think we can look forward to the, the orchestra evolving um, and certainly continuing with us. Thank you. <laughs>